Mini episode 596 of the FDH Lounge is brought to you by Sportsology, delivering unconventional columns and webcasts about sports, TV, music, movies, and more. Follow them on the web at sportsology.com. The FDH Lounge. You want to schedule your life around it. A long time ago, on a gloomy, wet Cleveland spring night, two men stand alone amidst the late night drizzle. Their voices echo across the vacant station parking lot as they debate the merits of the great American radio show that have been missing for far too long. On that night, an idea was born. That idea became the FDH Lounge. Welcome to the FDH Lounge. Welcome, everyone, to FDH Lounge mini episode number 596. This is FDH managing partner Rick Morris. We have Mike Harmon of Fox Sports. Mike? Welcome to the FDH well, Lounge. Welcome back. Good to talk fantasy football with you today. Well, I mean, it's football season again, because normally you guys don't open the phone lines to just let me rant like a lunatic. But, uh, <laughs> you know, here we are. We're, we're at that point again. Draft season in, in full force and people ready for their holiday weekend where they will bend their elbows and make silly draft choices. That's why we're here to help them out. Well, we're here to hopefully uh, let them avoid some of the silly choices. And uh, exactly. along those lines... Well, let me just start with this. In, in terms of the strategic consideration here, for anybody out there that has the opportunity to select where they're going to be participating in their draft, for example, I, I'm in two leagues this upcoming weekend, sister leagues that work by the same rules. We all draw cards. But then from there, 1 through 12, that allots you the opportunity to select your position. And my general advice that I've been giving people this year is all things being considered, if you're in a serp, uh, standard serpentine league, I don't think you want to be drafting high. Uh, well, I would say for, for me, I would rather want to be on the back end as well. I mean, up top, it all just depends. If you're going from the standard format of your leagues where you're still starting two running backs, perhaps I, I hedge a little closer to the middle because maybe one of the top five running backs or six running backs, depending on how you stack them, falls to you there. Uh, otherwise, we're getting into the committee situations very quickly uh, these days. But as you're towards the back end of the pack, you're still getting your, your shot at Gronk or Graham and the top wide receivers. So certainly you'll, you'll walk away with two high-quality players to set you up nicely. By the time you get back, assuming standard 10 or 12-team leagues, uh, you're, you're starting to go a little deeper in terms of that value proposition. And the ad- idea of potentially reaching starts coming in already as you're getting that at the end of that second round. Absolutely. That's, that's how I see it uh, precisely. And staying on that point here, uh, in terms of the equivalent for folks in an auction format, essentially that would be not overbidding for the first couple of guys on the board. Yes, in terms of you know, not necessarily going $45 or anywhere in, in that uh, spectrum for any of the, the, the guys that are left up there because you know, there, there may not be the amount of difference between the Jamal Charles and the Julio Jones such that would justify something like that. Is that how you would see it as well? Yeah, I mean, the auction draft, uh, I like tossing guys out that let other people start bidding it up and, and eat into their cash pretty quickly because early on they, they want to make sure that they have their, their names, their known commodities. There's plenty of value coming later, uh, particularly as you look at the way the running back position is fractured and you look at your, your wide outs emerging tight ends in certain places. You know, it's unfortunate that we have the news on Julius Thomas because the logo on the side of his helmet was making him a bit of a, a draft value play, uh, as you see with a, a number of other teams in that regard so uh, i i think that's the way to go and, and you know pick off your guys at the end absolutely along those lines there and i just want to clarify for any of the listeners not a misnomer when i coupled julio jones there with jamal charles because that was going to be my next question my sense is again you had alluded to it so few running backs that are a, a real bell cow in the fantasy football sense anymore here Is it a situation now increasingly where you just want to get out of the first two or three rounds? I mean, you want to have obviously some semblance of balance in there at some of the different positions, but but where essentially if if you can count on two or three guys to have explosiveness just kind of carry the day, where the specific position may not be as important, you look at how Odell Beckham carried a number of teams last year, Mm -hmm. including my own, to a championship. And it used to be the, 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 the sense that you had to have two running backs very early on, and I'm almost getting the sense uh, these days that it's just, it's not nearly as important on the positions as it is the explosiveness and the guys who can carry you. 
That's just it. I mean, we're looking at consistency over the course of the year. And I, I heard you mention Julio Jones, and I always there's a shiver that goes down my spine whenever I hear his name uh, because he's a guy that on a week to week fantasy league, you know, you're playing daily leagues. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm waiting to see what his valuation is for that week. Over the long haul, the numbers are going to be there, but he's a guy that is going to tank a few games for you as well. Look at it last year, nearly 30 percent of his production came in two games towards the end of the season. By then, you were probably already decimated uh, by what he hadn't done for you over the course of the year. Only six touchdowns for all that yardage and receptions. Uh, a little nerve-wracking. But you, you look at the, the running back position, right? People, You can find a, a way to argue yourself out of, I think, every running back at the top except for Marshawn Lynch. Everybody else you look at, all right, Adrian Peterson coming back off the first year, off a full year away, hitting near 30 and all those things. But – people still want to elevate him. Le'Veon Bell, forget about the two-game suspension. Pouncey missing off that offensive line, absolutely huge. Eddie Lacy, now they're missing some of their their weapons downfield. You don't know how healthy Randall Cobb's going to be out of the gate. He's a beast, but will they try to spell him and look, and spare his his touches like they did a bit last year to where you weren't getting full value for him week in, week out. Charles, the age and the number of touches and so on. C.J. Anderson looks to have emerged uh, and in Denver they're not going to have quite the same push that we had expected with Monty Ball being a guy that was, well, on the verge of getting himself cut. So, you know, you just have all these questions up top. You want consistency. You want a guy that you know is getting your consistent 15 to 20 touches there. Or if you're at a wide receiver or tight end, you know you're getting your seven to ten targets per week out of the gate how they fall out from there well you let the chips fall where they may but you got to at least drive for consistency at the at the top of your order absolutely and and again and i don't want to sound ungrateful as somebody who also had marshawn lynch on that championship team last year but that's the guy you mentioned <laughs> just want to play a little bit of devil's advocate there because i know where you're coming from that's a situation every year where people keep looking at that and going oh well maybe this is the year that michael or turban starts kind of spelling them a little bit and you know pete carroll has been very stubborn much to the appreciation i think of all of the fantasy owners out there but <laughs> everybody's looking at the marco murray and th- that's the obvious candidate for like whoa is, is he going to hit the wall here after the kind of year that he had last year lynch has had a couple of years of heavy tallies coming into this one here so to what extent does that concern you that uh, we, we may be just around the corner from a speed bump that nobody even sees yet well, you, you think it might be there a little bit. We'll be curious to see how the offensive line goes. Obviously, they make the big trade, take away one of their big pieces in Unger to bring in Jimmy Graham. But now they actually, in theory, have a little bit more balance than they've had in the last couple of years where you have a true number one target for Russell Wilson downfield, even though Jimmy Graham has been joking about how he's going to block 75% of the time. You're still looking at a guy who's going to stretch things, and, and now you've got, to, you've got to pick your poison as to whether you're going to try to stack the box or if you leave Jimmy Graham running around down the seams uh, one-on-one and, and get those mismatches. Now you're really in trouble. So you, you look at that, that squad. I'm not so concerned about Lynch. With DeMarco Murray, you look at the big runs last year, the number of runs he had over 15 yards, the explosiveness is there. For Philadelphia, it really comes down to, is Sam Bradford upright? Right. If we get down to Mark Sanchez or, dare I say, a Tim Tebow down the road, I'm not sure what Mark, Matt Barkley's role in this whole thing is because everybody loves Tim Tebow. I've been asked about him more in the last two weeks by casual football fans than anything else happening in the preseason. It's Deflategate and Tim Tebow. Those are the two topics I've been carrying every time I drop my kids off at school. Hey, what about that guy? It's like, really? Really? Still in? Okay. But when we look at DeMarco Murray, they're going to split things. You're going to see a little bit of Matthews. You're going to see some of Darren Sproles. But the reality is you've got a guy in Murray that was a big play threat. This wasn't all four yards and, you know, 3.8 and a cloud of dust. I mean, there were a lot of big runs in what he was able to do behind that Dallas offensive line. And the way that Chip Kelly likes to run his offense, you got a lot of plays. Sure, he's going to get spelled, but there's going to be some opportunities where you've got defenses sucking wind and you're going to have some big gainers from DeMarco Murray. I think people are pushing him down the draft board quite a ways and, and far too much. That's very interesting. Where would you slot his value approximately? Because he's a guy, I look at him, I, I may be one of those people that you're thinking is too conservative on him. I, I look at him and I'm thinking maybe later second round. But are, are you thinking that uh, the, the, the risks don't uh, outweigh uh, the benefits and he should be higher than that? 
I think you're either in or you're out. I mean, if he's a guy that you totally mistrust, and there's certainly those guys that, again, coming off 400 touches, you're, you're going to be looking there with a, a bit of skepticism. But, you know, he's a guy that I still have sitting at number seven on my running back board. He's ahead of Hill. He's ahead of C.J. Anderson, just behind Forte, ahead of LaShawn McCoy. And, and I've got him and, and Justin Forsett valued about the same because Mark Tressman's back where he should be as an offensive coordinator instead of ruining my beloved Chicago Bears. So I've got them slotted about the same and then you, you start drifting down a little bit from there but you know for DeMarco Murray yes there's an injury history there's fears and certainly the log uh, the touch log that he had last year when you go back and look game by game you're a little bit scared but that the big play threat and just the way Philadelphia wants to play now I'm not getting on the bandwagon and I'm not pushing you know doing the here's my boot up on the table saying it's a shoe in that these guys are running deep into the playoffs but at least out of the gate while they're healthy you're going to get some good production no question about it and actually uh, I join you on the Justin Forsett uh, thing here and not a lot of people seem to be People seem to be looking for a lot of regression from him, but I agree with you on the, uh, the, the fact that he should be uh, right by where Murray is on a draft board. I think what's happened with him is, to some mm-hmm. degree, people are looking at his history. Right, He couldn't be the guy in Jacksonville, bounced around a bunch before finding a home in Baltimore. Gets the advantageous situation of everything that goes on with Ray Rice. He's the next man up. And now you bring in Tressman. Look what he did with Forte. 102 receptions last year. You're going to see a lot more of Forsett out of the backfield as a receiver. And even if the weapons as they stand right now don't look daunting for Joe Flacco's offense, they're going to be able to push the ball. They're going to move the ball around, and they're going to put up some points. And, and I think Justin Forsett's a guy that's going to run through some gaping holes based on the way Trestman runs an offense. Did I want him as a locker room leader? No. But as an offensive coordinator, the guy's got a great mind, and Joe Flacco, the quarterback, to make that thing run. I think Forsett's a guy people are sleeping on. I agree with that completely, and uh, I think you're right about that, about the notion of people holding uh, his past against him and, my God, the, no- the notion of uh, failing to carry Jacksonville to the playoffs, you know, that's like a real Singapore <laughs> standard of justice if we're looking at him that way. But I think you're right. I mean, the people are holding that against him. And, uh, again, he-, he really did establish himself there. He's going to have, as you said, a system that is very, very favorable to that as well. Somebody else that uh, has a system that is favorable in that same division to great production. Uh, no, I won't say Isaiah Crowell off of my beloved Cleveland Browns, but <laughs> Le'Veon Bell in Pittsburgh. I love Crowell, but let's be realistic here. Uh, Le'Veon Bell in, in Pittsburgh. And I know there are some places out there uh, and there are some people that uh, I respect highly that still have him very, very high on their boards, some as high as number one overall. That's not something that I find defensible in light of the fact that you're punting the first couple of games of the season here and for a uh, standard 13 or, uh, unfortunately, in my case, 14-game uh, schedule uh, that my league happens to have. But that, uh, two games is still a decent chunk out of that regardless, whether it's 13 or 14. So how do you see the risk-reward uh, basis there on a guy you know is going to be out at the outset? Yeah, I mean, you see the ridiculous production he had a year ago, everything clicking and, and becoming a, a full – full-time back. I mean, just ridiculous uh, effort that he put forth. I mean, you get the 45 receptions out of the backfield uh, and and still, I'm sorry, 83 last year, 45 the year before, uh, plus all the, the rushing total and didn't show any signs of breaking down, didn't have any issues. I think people are are undervaluing what Marquise Pouncey's loss means to this team. The two-game suspension, I think you can overcome because when you're looking at your value here and you're saying, well, this guy's only 23 years old, he's not had the thousands of touches that the rest of these guys have had uh, that you're drafting up at the top, I I can understand where you you come off saying, well, I'll take the two-game hit at the front and then we'll move on from there. But it's the pouncy injury that has me more concerned that this team and that offense regresses a little bit, you know, not to mention now you've got Martavis Bryant down for a four games with him. So at least out of the gate, you're looking at Pittsburgh's offense, probably sputtering and that offensive line, again, no pouncy means you're going to have some, some rough goes and, and a lot of pressure up front. Cause we remember a couple of years ago when he was hurt that they, the offense really sputtered. And so I, I'd be a little bit afraid. He's a guy that I'd slot 
anybody in, you know, at the back end of that top five, you know, as you're looking at Marshawn Lynch and such, uh, I'll take Lynch and his production week to week and hope that in week 16 and 17 they're still playing meaningful football and they haven't run away and hid to where all of a sudden you're looking at Robert Turbin or even Fred Jackson should he sign and stay on there in Seattle. Great points. You absolutely do have to take a holistic look at the entire offense, uh, whether it be, as you said, the offensive line there in Pittsburgh or uh, the, the effect of you take Bryant out of the uh, the lineup there and what's it going to do. Yeah, all of a sudden, you're really looking at sacrificing some of that great uh, run-pass balance that they've had in Pittsburgh, especially last year, and that they were able to make happen. Something I want to ask you about as well, because I know this is uh, going back to the time of uh, the Fox Fantasy Freaks and, and listening to you guys on Sundays. I know that you guys out there uh, in the industry, uh, along with some other shows, uh, had, had been uh, t- talking about the last couple of years, as have a lot of people been talking about uh, targets and, and how much the quarterbacks are looking to specific uh, wide receivers. That's something that I want to ask you about because, to an extent, that's something I take with a grain of salt in terms of being, in, in some cases, a little bit of a rearview mirror kind of a factor. Uh, what, what kind of secondary were they going up against the week before? other considerations specific to an opponent. So as you look at it, what's your best advice for for people applying that? Because it's been very trendy to talk about the last couple of years, and and there certainly is some value that can be extracted from looking at that. But how would you uh, uh, recommend that people specifically look at the amount of targets that their receivers are getting? Well, it's going back to the uh, analysis that we flopped out on, on Julio Jones a little while ago. You can't look at the overall numbers to get the picture. Yeah, it's all fine and good. If you're playing in a best ball, set it and forget it, and all you and your buddies are doing is sitting around drinking and watching football for 17 weeks, then it works. But if you're going week to week and playing head-to-head matchups, you've got to get granular. You've got to see where the ebb and flow are. Uh, are there weeks? And, and certainly offenses change over time, but if you've got a coordinator – quarterback, coach, stability. I know that's a very rare commodity in the NFL anymore, but if you have a little bit of stability there, you could see what the tendencies are, what the trends are, and where a guy's role is. And and certainly that becomes very ill-defined as you get deeper past your, say, WR2 spot on your fantasy roster, but it's at least worth looking into to where it's not, okay, they were getting buried, so all of a sudden this guy had an eight-target game, and now you're going all in on your free agent acquisition budget on the waiver wire foolishly when you had a one-game one breakout, you know, now with injuries or other issues notwithstanding. So uh, I think a lot of it is you've got to get a little more granular and, and get, your, get your hands dirty as you go through the data because if you just take it at face value, you're probably going to miss something. That's exactly the answer I was looking for. I, I agree completely. Uh, you really have to apply it specifically to a situation. One of the things this year that we put on our draft board was target completion percentage. It's something I hadn't looked mm-hmm. at previously, and I was really looking forward to being bearish on uh, Calvin Benjamin this year. It, it's uh, unfortunate that he went down. Uh, I was shocked to find out that he only converted on 50% of the targets that came his way last year, which is a, a pretty bad number. So in all cases, again, this is not universally going to be drops, but a lot of times, for whatever reason, these are just looks that aren't being converted in. Is, is that something you'd recommend as the season goes along in terms of being granular for folks to look not just at the targets, but like, hey, what's their catch number, too? What's the correlation here? No, that's absolutely true. And, I mean, how many shots are they taking downfield where you got guys, you know, Torrey Smith or, or players of that ilk where you've just got so many of their – pass attempts, the targets that they're getting, and there's not quality chances. So when you're, you're going to the needle in the haystack of, all right, they're throwing it up for them, and now I'm wishing and hoping. Because you don't get the points for the pass interference penalties they draw. That's great for right. standard football. That's great for moving the chains on Sundays. But that's not helping your cause, right? So you, you look at last year, uh, Torrey Smith, 89 targets on the year, 21 of them uh, beyond 20 yards. That, that's that's not a percentage I want. I want a quarter right. of my, my guys receiving targets to be beyond 20 yards. Just the completion percentage just blows up. You mentioned Kelvin Benjamin. He was a guy that you look at the talent, you like it, you're curious to see how it would work with Devin Funches. Uh, unfortunately, you don't get to see your theory come come to fruition and, and see how, how you're – 
the things you're you're putting up in your little notebook that you had in science class in high school, uh, all your theories and your test elements, you're not going to be able to see that come to fruition. So we move on from there, and then people have to figure out how they want to value Cam Newton, which is a very dangerous proposition as long as he's still one of the few quarterbacks that's willing to take the ball into his own hands and run. He's going to have weeks that, you know, not really doing much via the air, but the rushing totals are going to help bolster his his production. But, yeah, I, I think a lot of it is just going back through and, and looking at the completion percentage, looking at where the targets are on the field, you know, like shot clock charts in basketball. You know, when a guy has a two for 23 night, is he missing stuff from inside the key or is he just, you know, a reckless rec league chucker? Uh, down towards the three-point line every time he touches the ball. It's the same thing here. Where's the quality of the catches, catch attempts? How many times is he being targeted in the red zone when there's an opportunity there? Or is he just a non-factor in, in those kind of situationals? And week to week, you'll start to see those trends develop just like we do. Uh, we see which offenses are terrible, which defenses. We have all our, all have our theories coming in, uh, but certainly things change on a dime in this league. One injury, one slip of a defensive back and suddenly it's a whole different ballgame. They really do. And in terms of Cam Newton, I'm always hesitant to ascribe anything to the supernatural here, but uh, it almost seems like one way or another, doesn't it, that there's a quota, that he can really only have one weapon at a time. And a year ago, they should have hung on to Steve Smith and brought in Benjamin. Didn't do that. It's just Benjamin. This year, it looks like Benjamin's going to get some company. Now it's just Funchess. And you, know, you, you can't even really count on the kind of year from him that you got from Benjamin because that's a lot to ask for from a rookie. So, you're very right about that. It is very, very hard to value Cam Newton, and uh, a lot of that has to do with circumstances beyond his control, it seems like, in terms of just getting him uh, the amount of weapons that other top-flight quarterbacks have. Back-end QB1 based on the running potential and the fact that I love Thor, I mean Greg Olson, uh, who's as steady as they come. <laughs> The guy gets no credit for what he's done there in Carolina. Yep. He was an unsung hero in Chicago uh, before they dealt him, and they, he's a guy that still remembers uh, how bad things got in Chicago. Uh, as a couple of conversations I've had with him through the year uh, will uh, reflect, but you're looking at him. He's he's there. You've got Funches. You don't know what you're getting. He's, he's missed a bunch of the preseason with injury, so you're waiting to see there. And then Jonathan Stewart's your number one. You're not exactly instilling confidence that you're ready to roll. You're really hoping for the defense to put them in advantageous field position. Otherwise, it could be a long year for Ron Rivera and his crew. No question about that. And in terms of Olsen, you mentioned uh, Julius Thomas before and his injury is going to take him out at the outset. Curious to get your sense on this because it, it sort of depends on who you talk to this year in terms of perspectives with the tight end crop, whether it's class half full or half empty. I mean, if you, if you believe in continued progression forward from Zach Ertz, then you're probably inclined more to say uh, positive or if Jordan Cameron can stay healthy. Certainly we saw that in Cleveland in 2013, what he's capable of. So it, it seems to be like one of those paintings where you could squint at it and you could kind of see one of two scenarios popping out at you. How do you see the tight ends this year overall, or do you think it's somewhere in the middle? I love it. I love it. I think it's very deep. I mean, obviously you want the the old Ronco set it and forget it mentality. Yeah, you've only got a handful of guys that you're feeling good about, and even a couple of them come with huge injury tags with them, right? Kelsey right now banged up for Kansas City. Doesn't look like he's going to miss any time, but any time you got a, the big red arrow next to him already, you've got to be worried. Uh, you got Jordan Cameron, who missed a bunch of time last year. Look, I've done nothing but gush about Ryan Tannehill all off season, waiting, wishing, hoping for the day would come, and then all of a sudden everybody's jumping on my bandwagon. Uh, I built it you can all back off uh and then you, you got guys like charles clay right very quietly former dolphin tight end now up in buffalo who's an inexperienced uh potentially terrible quarterback's best friend his tight end might be, uh, be able to push the ball downfield but charles clay is going to be very active in that offense antonio gates missing four games off the gate sliding down draft boards he's still going to end up as a top 10 player you're, that's four games left that you got to worry about his toes and feet and all the other stuff that's kept him at bay in years past that you don't have to worry about. Yep. He should be available for your fantasy playoffs in an explosive offense. Value there. Uh, the comeback of Kyle Rudolph depends how much you want to push into the center on that, but you look at the offense. We talk about Peterson. You talk about Mike Wallace, the progression of Teddy Bridgewater. You should have opportunity there. And a guy that I think as my number two tight end with great upside – I'm looking at Vernon Davis. 
all reports out of San Francisco is they're going to let Colin Kaepernick go back to being Colin Kaepernick. I think that means great things for that offense. It certainly does. You you would think that's the case, and, and that's that's the epitome of a guy that people are really sleeping on. And there are some squads like mine last year that uh, really suffered by having him on there. So mm-hmm. uh, he really sort of uh, isn't isn't he one of the poster children in, in 2015 for that notion of. Again, don't hold grudges, be dispassionate, and if somebody's dropping because other people have the bad memories the same way that you do, there may be an opportunity to find value. Becomes a value proposition, that's exactly it. You still look at a guy who was a double-digit touchdown monster for years. Last year, we could say was absolutely dysfunctional. Coming into this year, 49ers, team that have been written off altogether. They, they've been uh, the running joke based on all of the issues that the team has had, the introductory head coach uh, press conference, Tom Sula, when he came off as anything less than, you know, we talk about being presidential, being what you'd expect from a head coach. You, you have the sudden retirements, everything, and everybody's just sleeping on these guys. Everybody's forgetting. I think there's an opportunity here where you, you might still still find some value later on. Yeah, he only caught 26 passes last year. Everybody else writing him off means he's a dollar auction grab that could pay huge dividends. Well, not only that, I think it's a thing where, to, to make a comparison to the markets, when you tend to hear these days with, with, with some of the, uh, the turbulence that there's been in terms of a rush to safety uh, in different ways here, does the same thing kind of apply for tight ends like Vernon Davis, and you mentioned Olsen before? When you have some turbulence in the offense, you've got the turnover in San Francisco. We've seen the increased questions about Colin Kaepernick and how he fits into uh, the NFL style in the last year or so. In, in a couple of ways, it almost seems like the tight ends in those circumstances, if not the equivalent of a blue chip stock, do seem to offer a little bit uh, more more safety, maybe a, a, a higher floor, if not a higher ceiling necessarily. You got it, the exact, exact thing, the safety valve in an offense. Dump-offs to running backs. I mean, that's where we're at in this day and age where you've got – blocking tight ends, and then you've got the big pass catchers. You look at Delaney Walker a year ago uh, in Tennessee. He got out of San Francisco after having a nice season, has a huge breakthrough last year. He's still going to be a top guy as Mariota gets his feet wet. They don't have the explosive options on the outside that you can trust game in, game out. It means Walker's still going to be a guy near to double-digit targets most weeks as you go through. Cincinnati, how much is Andy Dalton on the hot seat right now? Yeah, we love A.J. Green, but Tyler Eifert suddenly a guy that you're looking at going, okay, there's a great opportunity here. And just go on down the line that the young quarterbacks, that's where they find their peace, their comfort. Captain Checkdown, Derek Carr a year ago, Michael Rivera suddenly became a big threat for him. We'll be curious to see how much they stretch the field with Cooper and Holmes once Holmes is available. But you still have to expect Derek Carr, as he's trying to be careful with the football, is still going to go to his steady tight end as you go through. Blake Bortles, that's why I'm sad about Julie. Julius Thomas. Everybody was down on the logo on the side of the helmet. I went back and watched a lot of tape on Blake Bortles. I was feeling pretty confident that this was a guy that was on the come and that Thomas would be a huge part of it. Unfortunately, the injury now takes you out a month. So, you know, you're looking at those situations and certainly offensive coordinators, you can read into their histories and find where there's some value play there as well. But yeah, young quarterbacks, that's the safety valve. That's like their teddy bear. That's true. That's true. And, you know, you, when, you, when you talk about uh, ability to get uh, tight ends featured, certainly Kyle Rudolph in Minnesota, when you're looking at uh, Norvell's past history with uh, tight ends, whether it be Jordan Cameron or going obviously further back in time, he's had a lot of success in that realm. So uh, there, there's a lot that basically co-signs on what you said there. Uh, in, a, in a more general uh, sense, uh, any other uh, recommendations for this season as, as far as uh, how people should approach things, uh, so, something that uh, seems a little bit different on the landscape this year uh, from seasons past? Well, I think the, the running trend, and we've talked about it a little bit in the past, was to eschew the selection of a quarterback early. It's going to be value. I participated in one of the you know, alleged expert leagues uh, drafts <laughs> about two weeks. Hey, you know, I, I, I'm uncomfortable with them, a talking head. I'm a guy that offers advice with a little bit more information by putting toothpicks in my, my eyes to stay awake and watch even the games. Uh, their, their parents don't. But as you, you go through, like in that draft, luck comes off the board in the third round. And I draft Aaron Rodgers. I'm thinking, nah, third round is not, not bad. Though. I mean, I didn't rush to him. And then you're in the eighth round, and that's when Ryan, Romo, and Brady come off the board. 
seventh round, Peyton Manning comes off the board. Like the weight on those elite quarterbacks is becoming more and more. You're going drifting back a couple more rounds, so you're going to have opportunities. So stock up on your running backs and wide receivers. And it's you know the theory was to wait. I thought I had. I already had my first two guys. Uh-huh. I'm like, oh, I could have waited longer and much, much longer uh, at that. The other thing is, you know, Tom Brady, when this is all said and done, he's not serving four. It's just a question of how many. So he's a guy that right now is being drafted 14th, 15th on average in leagues among quarterbacks. You're going to get far greater value than that. Be willing and be bold to uh, to put your name on it and go up and grab him a few slots higher. But I think as you go through, you're going to have a much more wide open offense here. So you're you're going to have depth that wide receiver that's going to play very big for you. Like we used to stockpile running backs uh, and. We still do because of all the committee situations. I think on those explosive teams, you're going to go a little bit deeper. And, you know, Ty Montgomery and characters like that are going to be drafted just as potential lottery tickets as you get deeper into leagues. Absolutely. And uh, there's always a lot of good post-hype candidates out there as well. I go back to, I think it was two years ago, it might have been three, uh, on the program. I remember uh, relating to you that uh, I was getting made fun of in my league for uh, regarding uh, Brandon LaFell as a breakout candidate, and you had my back on that, and uh, it took us until last year to be right about him, but sometimes a guy just has to be in the right situation. You saw it on the stretch when he was the best wide receiver on a team that won the Super Bowl. That's something to keep an eye on with the offseason movement here. Have, have guys who should have been able to get the job done in the past finally gotten transported to a situation where they can convert on it? Well, and that's just it. You know, a guy like Jeremy Macklin, who's always been – a top receiver, but has been one of the guys in Philadelphia. Well, now he goes to Kansas City, and lo and behold, Alex Smith is even finding him uh, in the preseason. Uh, A player like Brandon Cooks, yeah, he's not really creeping up on anybody, but given the fact that Marcus Colston is that much older and Jimmy Graham's gone, this guy's got no choice but to assume a much higher role. Uh, A player like Andre Johnson, who we've known for a decade, he's actually got a quarterback throwing him the ball. I know he's one of many guys in Indianapolis, but there's a guy that's going to represent value because people are going to say, ah, he's old, he's done. Like, nah, between he and Frank Gore, I'm not saying that they're going to be world beaters and that's the reason you're hoisting a fantasy title uh, trophy, but they're guys that are going to give you some pretty good value as you go down the line. Likewise, you know, John Brown emerging a little bit in Arizona as Larry Fitzgerald gets on in years. Anquan Bolden is old, old as father time, but he still is the best post-up wide receiver in all of football. So if you're in a PPR league, you know he's one of those guys as your third receiver. He's going to outperform your twos and ones with great regularity. So you go and you, you find those those value propositions, guys where the, the opportunity opens up uh, a little bit. You know, Brash, Brashard Perriman, if he can get on the field in Baltimore opposite Steve Smith, because Steve Smith's going to fight and, and go all the way through. Stevie Johnson out here in Los Angeles, that's all I keep hearing for the Chargers. Oh, Stevie Johnson's been fantastic. And then Terrence Williams in Dallas, uh, I think he's a guy people are sleeping on, still being drafted as a fifth wide receiver. Uh, I think we go back to basics, and Romo's got to chuck it up because as good as that offensive line is, they they have three running backs. They don't have one. That's true. That's absolutely uh, the case there. You mentioned a guy, and I hope I'm not uh, dooming him as uh, as I jinxed uh, Brandon LaFell in previous years, but Brandon Cooks talked about this before, target completion percentage, leading the wide receivers last year. 768, uh, an excellent number. Now, uh, unsurprisingly, you glance over at yards per catch, 10.4. A lot of times that number tends not to be as high there, but uh, you know, you're, you're going to sacrifice probably a little bit of the completion percentage as they start using him in a more explosive role. But that right there certainly shows you what he's capable of right off the bat. Big time speed option. I think they're going to use him all over the field, try to get him with some of those little flanker screens. They're going to get creative because this kid's got great potential, can go up and over the top. And as they morph that offense, it's going to be curious to see what happens. Drew Brees didn't really take care of the football in great stretches last last year. And I think a lot of that had to do with the fact that Rob Ryan, the dirty Santa Claus, and his defense failed miserably, putting them in bad positions. But as you go through, Cooks is now their number one guy. And being drafted accordingly, you're looking at fantasy drafts. He's a guy that you're going to have to invest in pretty heavily at the back end, first wide receiver, early second, if you want in on him. And if you look at the history of Sean Payton and and Drew Brees, 
referees when they've gotten together and they've gotten things clicking. They'll make superstars out of guys with lesser talent. So this is a guy that the industry is all over, and fantasy owners are already buying their jerseys ready for Sundays. Absolutely, and uh, that, that they have very good reason, I think, to look forward to that, uh, as we have to look forward to uh, an awesome season this year. And, again, I certainly look forward to starting off my Sundays, uh, as I generally do, when I'm in my car, checking you out on Fox Sports Radio. Grateful that uh, my affiliate here on the North Coast carries the show. So whether it be uh, Fox Sports Radio, foxsports.com, swollendome.com, always a pleasure taking in all things Mike Harmon. Always a privilege to have you on the show. It's a true pleasure anytime we get a chance to speak to you, Mike. Look forward to doing it again, and thank you so much for being available for us. I'm uh, honored to be part of it. You know where to find me, and, and certainly we can be in our mutual admiration society for some of those players we just spoke about. We're going to be right this time. No more Brandon LaFells. Brandon Cooks is a guy you want to buy on. You heard it here first with the two of us. Really appreciate it, Mike. <laughs> Thank you so Be much. Be good, my friend. Thank you all. Yep. I appreciate it. Thank you all, everybody, for tuning in today. The FDH Lounge Mini episode number 596. As we bring the show to a close, we would like to extend our deepest gratitude to NBC, CBS, ABC, Fox, all clear channel affiliates, TNT, TBS, USA, UPN, Deadspin.com, YouTube.com, YTMND.com, MySpace.com, various blogs, Fox News, CNN, CNBC, MSNBC, IamBoard.com, Billboard.com, Google.com, ESPN, ESPN. ESPN2, ESPN News, ESPN Classic, NBA TV, NFL Network, Sports Time Ohio, Athlon Magazine, Comedy Central, Cartoon Network, The Boomerang Channel, QVC, BET, The Spice Channel, Steno Notebooks, Manwich, Paper Mate Office Supplies, Waitresses, Strippers, Bartenders, Garbage Men, Janitors, Microwave Popcorn, The Writers of The Office, Scrubs, Entourage, My Name is Earl, Oz, Metalocalypse, and The Boondocks, Aquafina, and The Periodic Table of Elements. 